ourselves and receive them and bring them to Jesus. And I just want to thank you for the support uh, that you are showing to God's children through this ministry of the church. Uh, no small amount of the church budget is being used for evangelism through education. Uh, not only are you showing your support by your gifts financially uh, through the church budget, but you are giving financial gifts straight to the school as well. Um, and not only that, but you're giving your skills, your labor, and your time. And these are all invaluable for the success of our ministry. We just finished our annual uh, Apple Pie uh, Day fundraiser for our ski program. And a number of you showed up to help with that and made it a great and successful day. We made 755 pies uh, in one day. It was awesome. Our entire program continues to build and get better because of these gifts of your time, your money, your talents. And we appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you for being there to help. Um, this year we spent a, a good amount of our budget at SJA on, in, on bolstering and improving our curriculum so that we can offer quality academic program that is centered on Jesus. And not only are our kids benefiting from this, but we have been blessed with the opportunity to share the special message that God has given us with students who do not come from a Seventh-day Adventist background. Um, half of our students fall into this category, and we've already taken opportunities to share the love of Jesus with them, even through some of our church's more uniquely held beliefs. Conversations and studies uh, into the state of the dead, the second coming of Jesus, the three angels' message, and the idea of a not eternally burning hell um, have been presented already, and each of these has been centered in who Jesus is and his love for each one of us and the grace he offers to each of us. It's been a wonderful experience to be able to share that, uh, especially with our non-Adventist students. I just want to briefly highlight uh, one story of a new student who has come to SJA this year. Um, the student's name is Bailey, and uh, we'll get her picture up. Go ahead, go to the next one. We'll get her picture up. Uh, the picture that's coming up is, there it is, picture of Bailey and her mom, Stephanie. Uh, some of you may have seen her. Uh, she has actually been here to church um, just a couple of weeks ago, and this story kind of came out of, uh, of this. I, we didn't even realize the full, full story until just a couple of weeks ago, and I got to chat with them a little bit about this. So uh, Paul Munia, who is one of our board members, was in Subway one day, getting a sandwich, getting ready to, to eat. And he was reading a book. He was pretty absorbed in what he was doing there. Um, and, uh, and Stephanie, uh, Bailey's mom, uh, is standing behind him, um, or in front of him, in, in line, and, and, says, and says, hey, what, what you reading there? It looks interesting. And he's thinking, okay, I, I'll tell you. It's, and it was a scientific book, and he just happened to mention, you know, it's a really great book, but, you know, it's not really from a Christian perspective, so you just kind of have to be, you know, be aware of that. But, uh, but, but you know, it's a good book. You should, you should check it out. And, and, and this got the conversation rolling into uh, Christianity. And she said, oh, so, so you, you go to a church? And he said, yeah, I, I go to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And, and the conversation kind of continued along that way. And he was able to share with her that, that, that yeah, we have this, this great church down the road, and we have a school, and... Um, and Stephanie said, oh, really, that's, that's fantastic. And he said, yeah, well, you should come by and check it out. Well, to make a long story short, one thing led to another, and they were looking for a new school, a place especially where um, that, that had a Christian focus. And so she thought, hey, I remember this guy that I met in, in Subway. Oh, by the way, she ended up buying him lunch. Um, and they took off and, and they didn't see each other again until just a couple of weeks ago when she came to church and he said, hey, I recognize that lady. <laughs> I saw her in Subway. Um, and so he was, he was able to, to, to just kind of plant that seed and, and she ended up coming to SJA and she got to meet our, uh, her, uh, the teacher, uh, Mrs. Ponce, Brandy, and, uh, and Jerry Philman and the, uh, in the classroom that, that Bailey would be in and they were just received with nothing but love 
and joy and affirmation, and it was something that they were really, really looking for. They, were also, they also have been looking for a, a church family. And uh, through this process, they enrolled her. She didn't think it would be possible to en enroll her daughter in a private Christian school, but, uh, but we worked through it and, and figured it out. And she is in school today, and she is thriving. Um, before, I, I was just talking to her yesterday, and she said that, you know, before Bailey came to SJA, she didn't really like school. It wasn't, she just didn't, didn't enjoy it at all, but she's loving it there. Her, her friends that in her previous school, she, Bailey said, they were boring. <laughs> and her friends here, she says, I just love them. And she is always coming home with stories about her friends and, and how things are going. And she's always talking about the science that she learned and the history that she learned and Bible class and this and that and the other things. She's excited. So this is just um, one example of a story how um, SJA is making a difference in not only the lives of our kids here, but the lives of our community. And uh, uh, we hope and pray that, uh, that uh, Stephanie and Bailey will um, come to church here a little bit more often. I know that when they were here just the other day, Bailey was up here singing with some of the SJA students, uh, for those of you that remember. And, uh, and, and when Stephanie came, she said, you know, everybody was just so nice to me. Everybody was just so friendly. And for that, I just want to thank you guys. Thank you for for being on the lookout for people that are new. Thank you for being on the lookout for guests and making them feel welcome. And I wanna encourage you to continue to do that because we've got a mission field just right across the field over there. And we are bringing people who um, do not always have a, a connection with the Adventist church and, uh, and, and bringing them into, into the connection here. So thank you for, for looking out for her when, when she comes back. I've, I've encouraged her to keep, hey, keep coming. We'd love to see them. And she wants to, to do that. And they're just trying to get their schedule going. So, um, you know, the end of the calendar year is coming up. And uh, I want to encourage you to consider a financial gift to the school. Uh, we do have dreams and plans for bathroom remodel and technology upgrade that's going to better uh, serve our students and guests. Um, and of course, every year we have students who can't afford to attend SJA without the help of generous people like you. Um, your direct contribution actually goes a long way toward evangelism through education. Idaho has a fantastic tax credit education tax credit that allows you not only to deduct your gifts to a nonprofit and lower your tax liability um, at the federal and state level, but you can receive a, a tax credit when you file that allows you to receive 50% um, of your donation back, up to $500 if you're filing single and up to uh, $1,000 if filing married and jointly. And if you own a corporation, um, you can also get that uh, tax uh, benefit up to $5,000 if you're a corporation. So um, that means if you're married filing jointly and you give $2,000 to SJA, you can receive $1,000 back for the tax credit and more on top of that if you itemize uh, your deductions. So I just want to just kind of plant that in your, in your heads a little bit and, and, and ask if, uh, if you would consider a gift to SJA this year to help us continue evangelism through education and uh, continue to spread our church's message um, through the education work. Uh, one last little message that I wanted to share with you from the students at SJA. Uh, this last Thursday was Veterans Day and we got to spend some time talking about what that means and the sacrifice that our veterans have, have made for us so that we can um, live and worship and study freely and uh, so this is a very, very, very brief clip, but uh, for all of you who out there who are, are veterans, uh, this is just a, a little message for you. Thank you for our service. Thank you for our service. Two times. Thank you for our service. Three times. We are thankful. Thank, Thank you very you much.
Good morning, happy Sabbath. This morning we're going to start our song service off with number 625, Higher Ground. We have this hope.
opening song this morning is number 532, Day by Day. Please stand. If you have any burdens that you'd like to bring before the Lord, please feel free to come up to the front, and there's our box that you can put your special requests in as we sing our prayer song. Gracious Father in heaven, we've gathered here today because we do not want to forsake the assembling together, especially as we see that day drawing near that's so very apparent. But most importantly, we're here to stir one another up to love and good works. And we want to demonstrate that most importantly by an urgent prayer request, even as we speak, uh, to show our love and demonstration for uh, Lou and Lisa and little Beaumont that's undergoing uh, appendix surgery even as we speak. Just give comfort, peace, and uh, direction for mom and dad as they prepare this young fellow for this surgery. And others in our church, Lord, we want to demonstrate our love also for those that are suffering for COVID. We just got word that 
Joy and Dave Brubaker are suffering with COVID and um, uh, others in our midst. Jim Ayer, friend of the Clarks, uh, I know him well. Others in our list here from COVID, Donovan Stevenson, Mike Stevenson's brother, and <clears throat> for Pastor Rodriguez, for Craig Meisner, others that are suffering through illnesses. We're glad that Kurt is with us today. And uh, we just lift up these prayer requests unitedly as a group uh, to stir one another, Lord, to care for one another, and to love each other, even as you first loved us. So um, we come to you in our unworthiness, Lord. Uh, may we find ourselves beating our breasts and finding our unworthiness, but you accept us so readily, and we thank you for that. And so forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us those areas that were uh, besetting sins that we're struggling with, Lord. Give us the victory. We pray for our country right now, Lord, that you would give us an un a certainty about that you are still on the throne and the prayer that we lift up on behalf of this country will change things. Uh, we pray then and come before you with Jesus of Nazareth, the great healer, to um, come against this scourge, this uh, play, uh, pandemic that's encompassed the world. We know it's uh, from, the, from the evil one, so we just come against it through the power of Jesus that healing will occur and, and prevention. Help us to follow the basic rules of health in all of our lives, Lord, that we might be able to uh, help those that have fallen or weak. So be with our speaker today. Uh, Lance, I pray that you'll give him uh, words from your special throne for us to give us help in time of need. And for this, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All the dollar bills. Um, Mr. Bill is going to have a story for you. Haley's playing for the Walker Tree Is there anybody else out there wandering around? There's some, still some money hanging out there. One like to grab that money. Right there. Right over to the right. There you go. We're going to get issue shopping carts here pretty soon for the kids. 
So they'll be roaming around looking for you for shopping carts. No, just kidding. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, I caught you off quick. You all sleeping? How many of you have an animal at home? How many of you have a dog at home? Wow, it seems to be a popular thing to have as a dog, huh? I bet you could tell me stories, all kinds of stories about your dog chasing rabbits, chasing this, pounding and all kinds of things, making all sorts of noises, right? Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me about, oh, it's so old. It's so old, it's over 50 years, almost 50 years ago. Someone almost panicked here. <gasps> How many of you out here over are 50 years or younger? There's not that many older than 50. How many are over 50? Oh, there's a few too. Okay, well this story is way back in the 1970s. Is that a long time ago? White bells and all that sort of thing. Ugly cars. Whew. Anyway, it's a story about me when I was in college. And I was going to school in California at a public school. And I had a roommate, and we had a house that we lived in. And my, my roommate, we had a big yard in the back. And my roommate said, I'm going to go get a dog. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Well, the dog was fun to play with and such. And one problem, when we went to school, you know what the dog did? He was all by himself. Oh! He's crying for fun, and nobody was there to take care of him. And the neighbors were going crazy. They're going, I gotta cover my ears. That dog is getting nuts. He's driving everybody crazy. The neighbors, oh! Until we all came home from school. And when we came home from school, he, oh, the dog was having a great time. And then we got this great idea that maybe it needs a companion, so they could both go, oh! Can you all do that with me? Oh! Well, oh, yeah, that would really wake the neighborhood up, wouldn't it? Okay, thank you. Anyway, so we decided we'd go down to the pound. Now, that's a, that's a very straight-cut word today to say the Humane Society, the shelters. But in those days, it was called the pound. And the pound is where they picked up dogs sometimes that had been on the streets and put in, the, in cages. And my friend said, well, what kind of dog are you going to get? And I had to think about that for a minute. What kind of dog am I going to get? And I said, I don't know. I'll figure it out when I get there. So I go down to the cages, and I put my hand out to the cage to dog. <laughs> well, that's not one I want. And I put my hand out to another one, and the dog would run off into the corner, and it would shake in the corner. And another one would just look at me. Well, I said, that's not going to do any good. So... I found a dog that I put my hand up to. Now, this is not the exact dog, but this looks like what it would be like. I put my hand up, and he would start licking my hand. He said, would you please get me out of here? Yes, yeah, see the dog out there? He looks like, I just want to get out of here. Please, I've been in this jail for too long. And my friend would say, oh, you want that dog? He's not going to be very productive, and he's very skinny because he'd been out on the street for so long. I said, well, that's the dog I'm going to take, and that's the one we're going to give us. So now we get in the car, and that dog got into my truck and put, set himself right down next to me and put his head on my lap. Isn't that nice? Oh, that's the dog that I want to have. But it was so skinny. I said, well, what kind of name are you going to give your dog? Are you going to give it Trigger? Are you going to give it Parky? Are you going to give it all kinds of names? I said, I don't know. I have to think about it. So we got down to our street that we were going to go back into our house, and you couldn't see our street sign. Set back a little bit too far. But so we told friends, if you're going to come to our house, you look for the sign that says Ped Exine. It'll come up. There we go. Whoop, up, back up. Ped Exine. I said, that's it. My dog's going to be called Ped Dog. Or we're going to call him Pedestrian. How would you like that for a name? I'm a good pedestrian. Well, I figured that dog would be a good pedestrian. So we would put it in the backyard, and we'd go to school, and the dogs would play, and they had a great day, and the neighbor said, oh, you must have got rid of those dogs. No, we didn't get rid of them. They're still near. So we'd take the dogs, jump them in the truck, and we would go to the beach. 
In those days, you could go to the beach and not have a leash on a dog, and we'd run on the beach back and forth, and the dogs would chase us, and they'd see the seagulls, and they'd chase the seagulls off in the sky, and everybody would have a great time. Then we said, we're going to go swimming. Man, we had, back then, we had little waves. They aren't too big of waves, but waves that would come in off the ocean, and we would go out in the water. And the dogs would sit there looking at us, and they go, oh, oh, oh i got to get out there. And my dog would say, I'm going out there. And it, he would start paddling his legs out to the water, and the wave would come in, and guess what he would do? There he is. He would surf in with us. <laughs> he had a great time all the time the waves out there and people started noticing that and said this is just amazing I've never seen a dog out there surfing well his body surfing kind of I guess but it would be surfing well eventually my dog and the other dog split up my friends went to his place in northern California and I was discovering looking for Christ as a friend and I found Jesus and God sent me back to school now I had a hard time because now I have a dog what am I going to live who will take a dog in? And I was able to find a location that had 10 acres of orange groves. Beautiful place. And the people said, I said, I have a dog. They said, that's okay. You can bring your dog. Wow. And it was only a mile away from school. So I could take my bicycle and get on my bicycle. And I'd say, uh-oh, here we go again. Maybe the howling will start again. I wonder if I could take the dog to school. It was a small school, so I took the dog to school on chance, and I said, now you're going to have to be a good dog here and sit here and wait for me. Well, you know what she would do? She would go on the class, and, well, oh, I back up one. Said, Meanwhile, she had 10 puppies. Oh, that was cute. So I missed this picture. But she had 10 puppies, and I had to give them all away to people. But they were really pretty dogs, weren't they? Anyway, so she wouldn't, I didn't have a leash on, this is just a picture, and she would stay right outside the school building and wait for me. That's what it looks like a guard dog, doesn't it? Yeah, but didn't have a leash on, and every day people would come up and say, oh, I know where classroom Bill's in, because pet dog's right there. And she'd wait till the bell would ring, and everybody come out of the classroom, and my dog would go crazy, and he'd take his tail, and he'd go round and round like an airplane. And he run all over the place, howling, skipping, jumping, and the people would stop and watch the dog having a great time. Wow, it was fun. There's another one on alert, ready to go, sniffing in the air, looking for something. Now, at the school where I went to, I had a job, and it was working with horses. How many like horses? Do you all like horses? Yeah, and this school had horses. I know one person here says, they didn't have any horses at that school. Yeah, they did. Now that's a city, right, Paul? <laughs> Yes, I had a horse corral, and they were all over the place, and I would take my dog down there, and my dog had a special job. And that's what it did. But you know what it's digging for? Gophers! And ground squirrels! Because those ground squirrels and gophers would dig holes, and the horse would sometimes step in the hole and could break its leg. So we are always filling up the holes for the ground squirrels and the gophers. Look at some of those little holes. That's just enough for hoof to get in there and take care of business. So my, the man that ran the place was so thankful that my dog was down there digging up the gophers and the ground squirrels. So here's the horses. And they were, <laughs> you can see those horses. They're so hungry. They're saying, come on, feed us. Stop standing on the corner looking for free money. And they were, some, we'd give them straw to them, and, not straw, but we'd give hay to them. And then some of the horses were treated with real respect and, because people boarded them there. And they said, well, I want to give my horse some granola. Big granola, all kinds of stuff in it. And they would pour molasses all over it. And it was in a special box. And we kept all these things. And so every day in the afternoon, I would take a scoop out, and I would bring it over to the special horses and give it to them, and they were so thankful. But Pet Dog was still busy running around chasing all the ground squirrels and all the gophers everywhere. There's some of the food. That doesn't bees. That's not little bees either. That's some of the grain that the horses would get. And we'd fill up those buckets, and I was so busy doing that stuff. And one day, while Pet Dog was out chasing around, gophers and ground squirrels, I came to the place to get the bucket, I put the grain in there, and I shut the door. 
And I went on my way. And I thought, oh, where's Pet Dog? Hmm. Pet Dog! Pet Dog! I said, well, maybe she went up to the campus and visit with some of the students. So I come and said, you seen Pet Dog? Nobody saw Pet Dog. I went up to the other school where the kids would wait, and she would stand outside the building and said, Pet Dog! Come on, Pet Dog, where are you? No Pet Dog. Oh, no. What am I going to do? I said, well, maybe she went all the way back to the house. It was only a mile. And she would go back there and sometimes would dig gophers out there in the, in the orange fields. And I went all the way home. No pet dog. Now my stomach started hurting. Because pet dog had been with me for almost six years now. And she was just friend, always with me and everything. And I'm going, oh, Lord, you know what happened? And I said, well, Lord... I don't know what to think, but I'm going to give it back to you what you so nicely gave to me. And there's a scripture I'll share with you in a little bit. Meanwhile, the next morning came, and I was all excited. I ran outside, and no pet dog. I went back to the school, and kids say, where's your dog? I said, I don't know. I haven't seen her. What am I going to do? So I went about my job getting the grain out of the box. And as I opened up the grain door, <laughs> what do you think? That was a big gopher? That was pet dog inside the box. I had locked her in all night long. And boy, I'll tell you, we're talking about a happy dog, she jumped right up in my arms. She was so excited to see me. And oh boy, that was such a relief. And I gave thanks to God right there. Now, would you like to see what pet dog really looked like? <laughs> Got the picture? Here it comes. There's pet dog! <laughs> Who's that hippie? You ever seen a hippie like that before? <laughs> she was such a wonderful dog. Oh, where'd that one come from? <laughs> That's pet dog right there. You know, all of these things are good things that God has given us, and he's provided... I don't know that keeps keeping in there. He's pro... <laughs> That's not bad, dog. That's a cute little girl. All right, go. Okay, so God always promises that if we think and ask him to help us in all things and thank him in all things and bless him that he gives... Whoops, I keeps getting that picture. I don't know where those coming from. Do you have that picture of that scripture? Not coming up. Oh, okay. It says, give me thanks always for how many things? All things unto God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was so thankful that God had given me Pet Dog for a companion, a friend, and a lover of all the people in the campus. I'm going to tell you one little quick question, too. She got so popular with all the students on campus, one day they were taking pictures of us, of everybody in the campus, so we know who they were. And they'd say, what is your degree? What is your major? And some would say, I'm going to be a physician. I'm going to be a nurse. I'm going to be an engineer. And they'd say, well, what's your interest? And they'd say, kayaking and um, water skiing. And they found my dog in the hallway. And they said, quick, grab your dog. Bring him in. We're going to take a picture of him. And they took a picture of and said, pet dog, major, human psychology. Interest, digging gophers. So your animals have an influence on all sorts of people. And if we give thanks to God for everything that he's done for us, everything will work out wonderfully. Thank you for being so nice and kind today. We ask for a blessing upon you, and you can go back to your seats now. Morning. Happy Sabbath. Well, that was a touching story. Thank you, Bill. It's interesting how God can teach us about faithfulness, even from our pets. 
Well, today's offering is going to the world budget, but the emphasis are on the radio ministries. I don't know if you realize, but it's been 92 years. 92 years since what? Well, 92 years, an Adventist preacher started a radio ministry called The Voice of Prophecy. The year was 1929. His name was HMS Richards. Back then, the radio was live rather than recorded, which meant that the Pastor Richards had to stay in front of a microphone certain time during the day in order to air. During the World War II, the Voice of Prophecy became the first religious coast-to-coast -coast broadcasting uh, program across North America. The year was 1942. At that year, also it launched the first Adventist Bible Correspondence School. Also that year, a Spanish language version branched off. Looks like the mic is a bit too hot. The Voice of Prophecy continued broadcasting around the world. It is part of the Adventist Media Ministry, owned and operated by, by North American Division. Today, the Voice of Prophecy can be heard in nearly three dozen languages. The Media Ministry operates the Discover Bible School with Bible lessons available in more than 70 languages. It also operates the website BibleInfo.com, a Bible question and answer website that received nearly 15 million questions or contacts every year. Did you know that 93% of Americans listen to radio every week while 88% of Americans watch television? Well, that makes radio leading media even more than television. The Voice of Prophecy uses radio to proclaim the everlasting gospel of Christ. It is leading people to accept Jesus as their personal savior. Please give liberally to this worthy cause. The deacons, please rise. Dear Father, we thank you for your mercies towards us. We believe that you're coming soon. And we also know that you said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. The night is coming when no one can work. Please, Lord, help us to follow your example. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
scripture reading is found in Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Let's bow our heads and pray as we get started this morning. Our loving Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this chance to come and to worship you. We ask that you'd be with us, and that you'd speak to us, and that you'd speak through me this morning, that you would send us a word that's pertinent and relevant for the time that we live in and what our hearts need to hear today. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus, who loves us so dearly. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> uh, this morning, we're going to start with a little story. A story about Dave and Crystal. Dave and Crystal were college students, and they had this dream to go exploring in one of the most remote and isolated and exciting places in the world. If you're thinking remote, isolated, exciting, what comes to mind? Where are we talking about? The Arctic, all right, that's a good one. What else? Amazon. The Amazon, we got it right here. 
the Amazon. They wanted to go explore deep in the Amazon rainforest. So they caught a flight into Brazil. They got into a canoe and went up the river to this remote lodge. It was kind of like a glamping situation, not really like Schweitzer Mountain Resort, but more primitive. And so, so Dave and Crystal are staying here, and they're just super excited because this is their dream, to explore the uncharted, deep jungle of the Amazon. And the first day they're there, they're just kind of getting acclimated, getting used to what's around. There's a few little trails that go around the lodge, and they're already super excited by what they're seeing. New insects, butterflies of all sorts of colors they've never seen before, flowers they've never seen before. They're hearing these birds and, and all these animals they've never seen or heard, the sights, the sounds, the smells. It's amazing. <clears throat> so day two, they have a plan to go on the longer trail that starts at the lodge. It's a three mile out and back deep into the, into the forest. They don't expect to be gone but a few hours, so uh, Dave grabs a backpack with cameras and a few water bottles, just enough for, I don't know, three or four hours out in the jungle. It's a well-marked trail. They should be, you know, home soon, back soon. And as they go, the deeper they get, <clears throat> the more exciting it becomes. They see, like, colors of flowers that they've never seen before, the sights, are amazing. They're taking pictures. Like, look at that. Look at that monkey up there eating that banana and all kinds of wild stuff. And they're just like looking around. And as they go, they start to wander off of the main trail onto one of these game trails. They didn't really notice the difference at first. And as they go, they're just taking pictures and they're just mesmerized by what's going on around them. And after a while, they stop and they look around and they say, man, this trail's really narrow. I don't remember it being like this. Well, no problem. We'll just backtrack. And so they tried to go back the way they came from. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and they get um, where they think the trail should be, but there's no trail. And so they head down another potential path. And they go this way for a ways. And man, the jungle is thick. It's hard going. And this does not also lead to the trail. And pretty soon, they've spent a while and they've gone every direction they can think to go, and they are not running into the trail. So Crystal says, Dave, don't you have the map? The map? Oh, well, he starts to feel his pockets. The map, yeah, the map. Uh, he, he looks in the backpack, and then he remembers. Yeah, the map that was on the table next to the backpack? I don't have it. But don't worry, he says, I remember what the map looked like. <clears throat> I've got this. It's a really simple map, hand-drawn. The lodge is at the bottom, and all the trails go off towards the top. And I've got a compass. So all we need to do is head south, and we will eventually run into one of these trails or even the lodge. We're not really lost. And so this is where there's six days lost in the Amazon rainforest adventure begins. You ever had a, a situation like this? this you, you'll, all of a sudden, you'll probably relate really well to what's going on for Dave and Crystal. You're at an intersection, and you're like, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going. So you uh, like get your app started to tell you which direction to go, and all you see is a blue line, and it goes that way. You're like, okay, I go that way. And so you turn your car, and you head that way, and the little beacon shows that you're going the total opposite direction. Has that ever happened to anybody in here? Okay, I was thinking like, man, I'm probably going to be the only one. It's going to be embarrassing. But no, the problem, what's the problem? The problem is that your map is oriented completely different than what you think. Every useful map on the planet is north, south, east, and west. Well, I'm trying to do it backwards for you. Dave and Crystal's map was not north, south, east, and west. So with all the confidence in the world, they're headed the opposite direction from the lodge, deep into the rainforest. Sometimes we can relate to this problem of having our spiritual map misoriented. You know, we have, we have the, uh, the map that God gave us because it's really a jungle out there, that's what they say. 
And it's possible for us to have this map, have it completely to scale, have all the points on the map labeled correctly, and be headed the exact wrong direction. We shouldn't have to guess about which way to go. And there's, we, are, we are this group of, of Christians who really take literally uh, Luther's maxim of sola scriptura, and we, we uh, place a really high value on understanding prophetic interpretations. <clears throat> but there's one primary objective when it comes to studying this map. And if you're thinking it's to get to heaven then I'm going to suggest that maybe your map is misoriented right now. What is the primary goal in studying the Word of God? Is it to know the right answers to controversial points of doctrine? That could be helpful and educational and useful. That's not the primary objective, right? Is it to make sure that you have something smart to say in case Dr. Soren asks you to give a sermon? Helpful. I'm not sure if we're being successful. Is it to avoid getting the mark of the beast? Is that why we study our Bibles? To make sure we don't get the mark? This is a hot topic. I mean, if you want to put a YouTube video up and get a lot of clicks, you put mark of the beast in the title. You want people to come to your evangelistic seminar, make sure you put that mark of the beast message way towards the end and really bill it big because people want to know about that. It's, it's the most exciting topic that we talk about. <clears throat> it's one of the things that make Seventh-day Adventist interpretations of Bible prophecy different from many other churches. But if we're studying the mark of the beast to avoid the mark of the beast, I'm afraid we might just be missing the mark altogether. This quote from Great Controversy, page 593, says, In order to endure the trial before them, and she's talking about people living in the very last days of Earth's history, so that would be us, right? They must understand the will of God as revealed in His Word. They can honor Him only as they have a right conception of... So this is the part that's really important. (coughs) Only as they have a right conception of his character, his government, and his purposes. Can only honor God as we have a right conception of his character, his government, and his purposes. So our primary goal in using the map, if it's anything other than finding a way to the place where we can understand the character and the government and the purposes of God as revealed in in his son Jesus Christ, we are using the map wrong. Like I said, we really get into our prophecies as Seventh-day Adventists. Um, We put a lot of value in in understanding how things are going to play out. We want to have the details all mapped out. We like timelines. Excuse me. We like to have things all figured out. And we're not really that different from another group of people who were studying prophecies expecting an advent of the Messiah, and these were the Jews and the Israelites of the time of Christ. In the decades leading up to Jesus' appearing and his anointing, they were studying their Old Testament scriptures really thoroughly. They knew, like, this is getting close to the time that we're expecting Messiah to appear. But Why? Why were they studying their prophecies? Why were they trying to map all this stuff out? You think they had a bunch of red ball caps that said, make Israel great again at the time? They wanted national restoration, didn't they? Were they using their map wrong? If that was their purpose, then yes, they were. They were looking for vindication, validation. We were right. We were right. We are the chosen. They were using their map wrong in that regard, too. Now, here's one that's a little bit harder to say. Maybe you're using your map wrong about it. They were looking in their scriptures for everlasting life. Are they using their map wrong about that, too? So Jesus addresses them in John chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, open up to John chapter 5. 
There's two verses we're going to look at, and the first one you know by heart, and if you're like me, the second one would be easy to know by heart, but you had no idea of what it said. John chapter 5. I'm not really good at finding Bible verses and talking at the same time, so you're probably all there before me. Verse 39 and 40. It says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So we know that verse. They're searching the scriptures for eternal life, and Jesus is saying, these are actually talking about me. But verse 40, and this is what kind of just, wow, opened my eyes. What does it say? And you will not come to me that you might have life. Jesus is saying, you can search the scriptures all you want to, but they're telling you, come to me. I have life. I am the life, and I want to give it to you. Jesus is the living word. He's the bread from heaven. He is the thing that all the Old Testament scriptures that they were studying about were trying to tell them about. But somehow they were putting so much importance on the right interpretation of current events and prophetic happenings that they were at risk of missing the one thing that they, or maybe even we, cannot afford to miss. Jesus offering life to all that will come to him. Maps are super useful. I like maps. I love like these national park, these waterproof national park maps that like you just unfold them and you just like, oh, take in all this information about this amazing place I want to explore. <clears throat> Maps are telling us a lot of stuff. I'm going to break it down into two main categories. Category number one, this is what most of the information is on the map, places you're not going. <laughs> information about everything that you're not headed to, right? Countless, infinite points on the map pointing to stuff that, are, that is not the destination. The problem is that sometimes we make non-destination points on the map the absolute destination. <clears throat> I've got a couple of real-life examples of this that I'm just going to share, and, and, and I use them humorously because surely no one in this room has ever made a destination point out of any of these before. This happens in other churches with other people, right? Like having a huge argument, maybe even like a church business meeting about whether or not it's okay to serve eggs at a potluck. All right, that never would happen, right? Never. Is it helpful to know about health and to make good choices? Is that your number one destination? It's not, okay. What about wearing nail polish? This is one in my house I have to think about. Is it okay to wear nail polish? And if yes, what color? For me, I've decided I shouldn't wear it. (laughs) And if I do, it's going to be a neutral color. But what about my wife and my daughter who's growing to this beautiful young lady? What decisions do we make? Do I make a decision that makes nail polish the most important thing? Or do I keep Jesus the most important thing? Amen. It's not a destination point issue. Okay, I I promise this is a real story. I wasn't there. I was listening to this. Somehow this was recorded and not edited out. It was amazing. There was a preacher and there was a young man in the front row. This was between meals. And we all know that we don't eat between meals, right? Right? Well, this young man was chewing some gum. I tell you what, the preacher felt it was really important to stop the sermon and publicly humiliate the young guy for chewing gum between meals and activating his digestive system. Making gum chewing the destination point on the map is doing such a disservice. Of course, we've got bigger topics too hot topics, if you got the vaccine or not. There's a lot of people who want to make a 
final destination point conversation around this. Ending relationships with family members over the issue. Satan is so excited when we make non-destination points all-consuming, all-absorbing of our attention, and then we use biblical research as a tool to drive a wedge between our brothers and our sisters in our churches. All right, the other category that maps tell us about are places we do want to go, opposite of places we're not going, the places that we are going. What is the destination? We'll look at Luke chapter 10 in just a moment, but here's the scene. You've got Jesus and 12 disciples, so that's 13, and you've got Mary and Martha and Lazarus, so we're up to what, 16? And I'm going to guess there's like four or five stragglers who probably weren't invited, or they're like the distant cousin or the nosy neighbor, and so we've got like probably 20 people. I don't know what houses were like, I don't know what Mary and Martha's place was like, Assuming it wasn't huge, uh, we've got a tiny place, and like we really agonize about whether or not we're going to invite guests this Sabbath for lunch. So uh, those of you that are coming to join us, like maybe this story is similar to what it's going to be like in our house, but everybody's crammed in to this small little place, <clears throat> and Martha is super busy. <laughs> Whenever I'd have friends spend the night when I was a kid, my mom would get up early and wash the dishes really loud. <laughs> because I'm sure we were up like, you know, carrying on, keeping my parents awake, but she'd make sure that like we could hear her washing the dishes (laughs) to wake us up. I'm sure she was doing it on purpose. So, So Martha's in there like meal prepping really loud on purpose, I'm guessing. And she comes out complaining because Mary is just sitting here at Jesus' feet. Um, So let's look at it. It's in Luke 10, verse 41 and 42. And this is another one of those things where As I was reading, I was like, oh, I know that verse, but I didn't really know the one before it all that well. So Luke 10, 41 and 42. Jesus answered, this is the part that I didn't have in memory. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. And that just went along so well, because it's easy to be careful and troubled about so many things that aren't the thing. And then Jesus says about Mary, one thing is needful. Only one thing is really needed right now. And Mary hath chosen that good part, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha's rushing around trying to make sure that the experience that she's creating for others is praiseworthy. This is Martha's focus, making sure that the experience she's creating for everyone else in our household is praiseworthy. And Mary would rather everyone just get on board with the new intermittent fasting fad and just skip the meal altogether because we can't miss a word of what Jesus is saying. This highlights another important point about uh, non-destination things here. In just about every scenario that we've talked about, the focus is on some externally observable behavior. Did you notice that? Let's look at a Bible story that illustrates this. I need some help from the kids. Who was Hannah married to in the Old Testament story? If you know the answer, kids, just like shout it out. I don't have candy to throw to you right now, but do it anyway. Elkanah? Yes, Elkanah, right? Hannah was married to Elkanah. Who was Elkanah's other wife? Someone over here? Panina, that's right. Panina, Panina. Uh, Okay, that's great. What did Panina tease Hannah about? Why was she giving her such a hard time? Because she couldn't have children. That's right. Very good. Okay, who was the high priest in Israel at that time? Eli. Eli. Good. Awesome. And what did Eli think about Hannah when she was praying at the tabernacle? Sophie? That she was drunk. That's right. So Penina was ridiculing Hannah because she thought she was cursed because she couldn't have children. And Eli was making assumptions about Hannah because she was pouring out her heart in prayer 
Were they right? They weren't right. Penina marked her as cursed. Eli marked her as drunk. But God marked her as his daughter. And he loved her and he answered her prayers. So here's the point. External observabilities are not good indicators of spirituality or favor with God. If we use our perceived spirituality of our brothers and our sisters around us to benchmark our own spiritual standing, we're missing the mark. And our own good behavior isn't a good indicator either, by the way. So I keep talking about the mark, like this underlying play on words with the mark of the beast, if you hadn't picked it up yet. I felt really clever about it at first. <clears throat> this is the part that I can relate to the most. All the studying that we do in Bible prophecy so many times ends up culminating in this big topic of how do I survive the apocalypse? That's what people want to take away from studies about the mark of the beast. And it feels like there's a lot to be afraid of here. We're not going to be able to buy and sell. That means people are going to lose their jobs. Supply chain is going to get disrupted. Inflation, economic crisis. Are we talking about a future reality or something else? Then we've got religious persecution, imprisonment, families being separated. Are we even going to be able to survive this? And so people want to, <clears throat> I say people, I'm a people, part of this group. We want to get in and we want to figure out what are the things that I need to do to make sure I make it through there. I'm going to make sure I've got a country property with a water source. We're going to be debt-free across all of our accounts. We're going to have privacy. No one's going to see us from the road or from our neighbor's house. <clears throat> We're going to have a self-contained power source. We're going to have a thriving garden and an orchard. Are any of those negative things? Absolutely not. They're helpful. Are any of those the thing that you need to get through the end of time? None of them are. None of them are. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply your every need. And it's singular. It, every need according to his riches by glory in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is your every need. And God will supply that. So why is it more important than ever to understand the character, the government, and the purposes of God? Because they are the framework that will give us the power that nothing else will to endure through the closing scenes of earth's history. A couple nights ago, we were having family worship. I was reading, and there's this story of this Pathfinder group and I guess that there was like the main church campus and then a road and a staff member's house was over here. And so this group of Pathfinder girls was working on a sewing project and they came across the road and they were here and then they had to go back to meet up with the, other, the rest of the group. And as they're coming across the road, there's a car coming kind of far off and they all figure we have enough time to get the group across the road and so they're working on it and and one of the staff members has a little kid, and they've, they've picked up the kid, and the last couple are headed across the road, and instead of the car maintaining its speed or even slowing, they can hear the engine revving up. This person is trying to run them over, and it increases speed as they're coming faster and closer. They realize, like, they're not going to get out of, way of the, out of the way of the car. <clears throat> and next thing they know, they find themselves on the side of the road. And as we're kind of looking down the barrel of this end time event that we can't seem to slow down and it's just coming at us and it feels like we're not going to be able to get out of the way of this thing. The, the author of the story says, I feel tempted sometimes to feel afraid when I think about the end of time. But I remember how much I can trust Jesus and how he wants to save me like he did the day he moved me from in front of the car. And I don't have to feel afraid. 
There's one thing I know for sure about God's government and his character is that it's a no-fear zone. <clears throat> it's not about fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, He's not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. How many times have you heard an evangelist say, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ? They want to say that all the time because people are, have trepidation about revelation, right? So if we just say, like, it's the revelation of Jesus, and people are way more willing to think about it. But really, keeping that at the front of our minds as we study chapters like Revelation 13 helps us so much if we won't forget that Jesus is the lamb who was slain in Revelation. He was risen. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's the one who's able to break the seals of all of heaven's mysteries. There was war in heaven, and Michael prevailed already. He wants to wipe away every tear from your eyes. His people overcome their enemies by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus commands his mighty angels, and they hold back the winds of strife until his children are safely sealed. That's Jesus in Revelation. <clears throat> He's awesome. And this word sealed, it's kind of like used in the same context with marked an awful lot. One we're desperately afraid of, the other we desperately want. We want to be sealed, we don't want to be marked. <clears throat> and I've done, I've done uh, Revelation seminars, so like I'm guilty for the same thing. But <clears throat> you, we, take a, we take this concept of a seal, and we compare it to earthly kingdoms, right? A king's seal has his name and his title and his territory on it. So tell me, what commandment has God's name, title, and territory? The fourth commandment. Very good. You know all about the seal of God now, so you're set. But what if the seal of God, being the observance of his fourth commandment Sabbath, was just an external observable indicator of the sealed condition of his people? This is just evidence of something deeper. To me, sealing is something like this. <clears throat> I was listening to your story hour yesterday. The kids were with me. <laughs> it's not always the case. <laughs> we were putting lunch together, and we were listening to the story of Ruth. I just love the way the scriptwriters put this together. And, and for me, this is, this is the sealing of God. Ruth comes to Boaz in the night. A total risky move. She has every opportunity to be humiliated and exposed by doing this. And she says, won't you cover me with your mantle? I'm your servant. And Boaz gets up and he says, don't worry about it. And Ruth finds out that there's someone else that has claim to her. There's someone else that has claim to Ruth. And she goes home and she's talking with her mother-in-law. I'm so worried. What's going to happen? And Naomi's like, Boaz is crazy about you. Don't you worry. <clears throat> but then she says, she says, Boaz will know what to do. And he will not rest until the matter is settled in his favor. Oh, it was just like, it just kind of hit me like a brick. God loves us, and he knows what to do, and he will not rest until the matter is settled in his favor. He's our redeemer, and he will seal us and save us, and I want that experience, and I pray that we have that experience together, and as we close, we're going to sing together. I'm going to invite the song leaders to join us.
Please stand with us as we sing our last song, number 647, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. Father in heaven, thank you for being with us today and for being among us. And thank you that you are our redeemer and that you will not rest until you have sealed us. We ask that we would be responsive to your voice in our hearts and in our lives, in our families, in our homes. Uh, that you bless your children as we go out today and that you'd be very near to us as we fellowship with you for the rest of the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>